Our session this evening is titled The Poetry of Amazement, where we have writer Vikram Chandra, who's going to speak to us about the ancient Indian tradition of Chitra Kavya. So just to let you know a little bit about Mr. Chandra, uh, his latest book is titled Geek Sublime, The Beauty of Code, The Code of Beauty. He's also written the novels Sacred Games and Red Earth and Pouring Rain and the short story collection Love and Longing in Bombay. His honors include the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, the Crossword Prize, and the Salon Book Award, and he's also been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. He teaches creative writing at the University of California in Berkeley, and his work has been translated into 19 languages. So please help me welcome Mr. Chandra on stage. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for coming. So before we start, for my own general knowledge, I just want to do an informal survey. Now, imagine that this is an exam hall and you were just handed an exam paper and the first question was, what is Chitra Kavya? Right? And remember, it's an exam, so you're not allowed to do guessing or any tikram baji. Can we have a show of hands? How many people would be able to answer that question? One, two. And how many people for, how many people would be able to answer the question, what is Shlesha? One. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, some of you might know that my last book was, it's a very strange book, which deals in part with a particular moment in the history of Indian literary theory in the ninth century when a very, very smart man named Anand Vardhana publishes a book called Dhanya Loka. And in it, what he's trying to do is to investigate the question, why is poetic language beautiful? And the answer he comes up with is that poetry is beautiful because it speaks without speaking. It's beautiful in its silences. And the idea is that poetry always works through what we call implicature in modern literary theory, right? Uh, if any of you have taken a creative writing class, uh, one of the first things you have been told is, uh, show, don't tell. So the idea is that you don't tell the reader what to feel, you show them a scene, you show them an image, you show them something, and you suggest the feeling, right? So this is Anand Vardhana, sometime in the ninth century saying, that dhvani is the soul of poetry. Dhvani is the word that he uses in Sanskrit, which means reverberation, suggestion, echo. So, the interesting thing about this book is that he's writing it for an audience which has amongst it some of the smartest linguists and literary theorists and philosophers that have ever lived on the face of this earth. So, it's necessarily a very dense book. It's very carefully laid out. The argument is very carefully laid out. But there's one peculiar moment in it about halfway through where he takes the time to tell us about a kind of poetry that he doesn't like. And this is Chitra Kavya. Now, what is Chitra Kavya? Obviously, if you're a Hindi speaker, you'll have some idea. Chitra is, of course, picture. Kavya is poetry. So the usual way, one way you can translate it is that it's picture poetry. Also, chitra in Sanskrit can have the meaning amazing, as in the Hindi cognate vichitra, right? So there's one way of translating it is to say it's the poetry of amazement. And then as he says in this quote on the screen right now, that if the poetry is not trying to suggest emotion, but that it depends on its effect, purely on effects of language, of sound, it's a kind of flashy poetry, right? And he looks down on it. And so he says that while chitra might be much used in the efforts of beginners who are seeking practice, it is established for mature poets that dhvani, suggestion, implicature, alone is poetry. Now, when he says this, he's being kind of a literary snob, right? And one of the ways to think about this is in terms of the social context. So this is uh, the first line on this slide is a line from the Kama Sutra. The reception hall is located next to the living quarters. 
right? And this is advice given for very rich urban people on how to be sophisticated townspeople. So if you're one of the beautiful people in fifth century India, you have a beautiful hall at the front of your house. And in the evenings, as that 13th century commentator whose words are in italics puts it, you invite all your really flashy friends, the socialites, so to speak, and they all come together. And what they do then is they engage in the 64 arts. Right? These are the famous Chausat Kala. And in the Kama Sutras list, it properly starts off, obviously, if it's an evening gathering, with music, instrumental music, dance. And the only point at which something literary enters this list of 64 arts is number 54, right? where you have to have a knowledge of Sanskrit, you have to have a knowledge of poetic meter, and you have to have a knowledge of versification and literary forms. And this is the kind of poetry that Chitrakavya is. So you can see now why somebody like Anand Vardhana, who's an eminent philosopher, a, a very serious intellectual, looks down on this kind of poetry because he thinks it's frivolous. Right? It's the kind of tacky things that rich people do to amuse themselves. OK, so let's go on. What is Chitra Kavya? What am I talking about? So instead of trying to describe it or give you a definition, I'm going to show you some examples. So this is from a 7th century poem by a very famous poet named Magha. And it's an epic poem, and what is going on in this verse is battle. The efficient army moved, the soldiers are yelling, uh, elephants are go moving through the ranks, and everybody is caught up in the battle. And it's very workmanlike verse. There's nothing interesting about it on the face of it. But if you start to look at this a little more closely, and you take the four lines of this shloka, and you take each line and pull it apart syllabically, right? You see what's going on? You've just taken the syllables in each line apart, so it becomes sa, se, na, and so forth, right? Do you see, kind of begin to see what's going to happen here? Let's draw a line like this, and another one like this, and another one like this. And now let's read along the red arrow. Sa se na gamana rambhe. What is that? It's the first line of the poem. Let's draw another line like this. And let's now read along the blue arrow. Ra se na sida na rata. What is that? It's the second line of the poem. And similarly, if you draw this line, ta, ra, na, da, ja, and so forth, what do you get? It's the third line of the poem. And if you draw a symmetrical arrow like the first one that we did like this, you get the fourth line of the poem. So do you see what's happening here? The entire shloka is contained within itself in a kind of holographic fashion. Pretty stunning. If you've ever tried to write poetry or even tried to write an essay, you should recognize how incredibly difficult this is to do. Right? You contain a poem within itself. But this is not all. Does, this, the, does the image or the pattern that these lines make remind you of anything? Do they suggest something? What's that? <laughs> do, you see? do you see how this works? So therefore, this shloka is written in a form which is called the murajabandha, the drum form. So what these poets did was by these arrangements of syllables within the poems, they made pictures inside the poems. Therefore, chitra kavya. Right? A bandha is a form, a bringing together. And so this is a Muraj, a drum form, okay? Let me show you another one. This is from the 16th century. It's a poem, it's a shloka about Krishna. And Krishna is in the wrestling arena. And he's being desired by all the women because Krishna, of course, is beautiful. He's in the prime of his youth, etc., etc. 
again, on the face of it, nothing very interesting about the language itself, right? It's, it's serviceable verse. But let's do a pulling apart of the syllables once again on this. And this time, let's draw a zigzag line like this. And now let's read along the zigzag. Samala range. See what's going on? If you read along the zigzag line, bouncing from one syllable alternatively to the other line, you get the entire first line of the poem. If you draw another line like this, an opposite zigzag, a symmetrical zigzag, and read along that, Shramani Radha Ratu. You see what happens there? You get the entire second line of the poem. Okay? So again, the shloka contains within itself, itself. Right? So it's a kind of meta pictorial poetry. Anybody see a picture in here? The ancient Indians had a kind of sense of humor. They called this the Gomutrika Bandha. <laughs> so do you see this? So if you're walking along behind a cow on a dusty Indian path and she starts to pee, this is what you'll see. Right? So therefore, this is the Go Mutrika Bandha. So in this tradition of Chitra Kavya, all of the figures that they made were not necessarily figurative. There were others that I think you could think of as abstract or conceptual. So here's one more. Uh, this is from, again, a very well-known poem from the 6th century. It's another epic battle poem. And here there's a general who is cursing his soldiers because they're acting like cowards, right? Because who are they fighting? They're fighting the great Arjuna. And if you have any sense and Arjuna is your opponent, you start to get scared, right? So he's yelling at them. Uh, despicable cowards, you once proved your mettle in great battles against demons, etc., etc. He's trying to like abuse them so that they actually start to attack Arjun. Again, nothing very interesting about the verse, but let's do a syllabic operation on it and pull it apart. Now, do you start to see it? Take the first line, the very first line in red, and instead of reading it from the left to the right, read it from the right to the left. Devakani ni kavade. What is that? It's the first line. Read it now from the left to the right. So if you look more closely at it, what you'll start to understand is that each line in this shloka is a perfect palindrome. Right? So you can read the same poem forwards or backwards, right? at least on the level of the lines. Again, I think pretty stunning. But there's a further complication in this, in this shloka. If you mirror the shloka on the x-axis, like so, Right? You just take all the lines and you reflect them, as it were, down below. What you then start to see is that it's a perfect palindrome in a mirror reflection in a vertical direction. All the columns that you have now made are also the lines of the poem. So what you could do is now something like this. You start reading from the left upwards. Devakani nika vade. Then you hop over one column to the left and you read downwards like this. You get the second line of the poem. You read upwards, you get the third line of the poem. And then you read downwards and you get the fourth line of the poem. But you can also read it like this. Right? So, as a scholar named Indra Vishwanathan tells us, what we have here is a dihedral symmetry called D4 in group theory, right? This is, any, if there are any computer scientists or mathematicians here, you'll understand what she's talking about. The ancient Indian poets had a much simpler way of describing it. They called it Sarvato Bhadra. It's auspicious in all directions because you can read this in all directions. Right? There are hundreds of ways of reading the same poem inside itself. So these are the figurative aspects of Chitra Kavya. 
there were other modes also of of writing this kind of poetry of amazement so one mode was called niyamam in which you set yourself artificial restrictions within which you then try to write poetry here is a shloka that is written using only two consonants b and r you see it now in sanskrit words compound with each other right so himalay is actually made up of two different words him as in snow alay as in a board and you bring them together and it becomes himalay one word so what's happening here is that both of these lines which seem like one enormous word actually splits apart into these words and then it becomes another battle scene right so this is dwai akshara a poem a shloka composed using only two consonants again i hope if you if you've done any kind of writing you should you should appreciate the insanity of what this guy's just done right he's made not only a sentence but he's actually made a verse using only two consonants but if you're living in pre modern india in one of the richest linguistic philosoph philosophical cultures ever if somebody is going to say i am going to write a poem using only two consonants somebody else is going to come along and write an entire shloka using only one consonant right so this is from the 14th century and if you do your um, sandhi vichay you take apart all the compound words what you end up is with this right and it's a very complex shloka that he's written in his devotion to vishnu and he calls himself the lion of poetry and logic a friend vidanta desaika and based on this one poem i'm willing to give him that right he's certainly a lion of some sort ek akshara is very very difficult to do in all the anthologies that people have gathered together over the years we've only found 29 of these right and this one is one of the best ones now how is he able to do this well sanskrit in particular has certain linguistic features that makes it possible to do this kind of poetry one is that you can make up words right so i'm sure maybe there's somebody in this hall whose name is pankaj and if you ask pankaj what his name meant he'll say lotus but what he might not know is that pankaj is actually not a proper noun in the english sense it's actually a descriptor j is the verb root which means to generate to give birth panka is mud so when you put panka and j together you get panka j born from mud therefore lotus but if you're a poet and panka j doesn't fit into your sound scheme you can do you can take nadi river and push j onto it and make nadi j also lotus you can take neer and make neeraja also lotus if you were living in contemporary sort of mixed english times you could probably make up something like reservoir ja right and it would still work right so it, there's a flexibility there that makes it possible to do this kind of thing um so in some of the lexicons the poetic lexicons from the second millennium there are many as 110 synonyms for lotus right because people just kept making them up according to the needs of the specific poem that they were working on also word order is pretty loose right unlike english where you have to put the subject and then the verb in sanskrit you can flip the order and make many different ways of saying the same thing right it doesn't matter what the verb is the verb can be at the beginning of a sentence or at the end of a sentence so these guys who are working within this intensely difficult form are using all the resources of the language to be able to do this kind of thing right but what is also really important to realize here is that who are the people who are able to read this right if somebody is making intensely difficult poetry it means that the audience who is reading this is intensely enormously sophisticated and educated right okay so those are some features of sanskrit now there's another feature of sanskrit that i want to point out to you i'm going to say a phrase in english and i want you to listen carefully to it and figure out what i'm saying okay 
gladly the cross-eyed bear. What did you hear? I'm sure a lot of you heard this. Gladly the cross-eyed bear, right? There's a bear with crossed eyes. But some of you, maybe who were stuck in traffic this afternoon on the way to getting here and are feeling really tired, might have heard this. Gladly the cross-eyed bear, right? So the linguistic construction of these two different sentences makes them sound exactly like each other, right? And notice also that in the second sentence, the one with the, the crucifix, the reason that this ambiguity happens is because I would, when you put I would next to each other, I and would next to each other, it becomes I'd, right? And this happens in other places in English also, right? So it's a Monday, but an egg, right? So certain sounds, when you put them next to each other, they transform the sound. It happens in French often enough that they have a specific word for it. They call it glissance or liaison. And in Sanskrit, those of you who have, who've had a little Sanskrit will know this happens all the time. Any two words or many two words when, they put when you put them next to each other start to sound the same. Now the question is, in terms of these two English phrases, what did I actually say? Did I say either of these two things? If you want to be pedantic and literal about it, you could argue that I didn't say either of these things. What I actually said was this. And that is American phonetic alphabet, which linguists use to describe sound, just sound. So what came out of my mouth was a continuous stream of phonemes or, or sounds. And then when you heard it under the surface of your consciousness, a bunch of cognitive processes went to work and they took those, that linear arrangement of sounds, they split it apart into different words, and depending on your internal state, on the context, it then passed that whole thing into a, into a sentence. So what happens with Sanskrit is because sandhi, or liaison, happens so often, you get this ambiguity fairly often. So suppose you're wandering around in Varanasi, and a pandit looks at you and says, Vriksha iha tishtati. One way, natural way that you would, might hear this and you might understand it is that what he's saying is, Vriksha ha iha tishtati. The tree stands here. Right? That's the way the, the sounds come apart. But interestingly enough, you could also completely legally and grammatically hear it as, Vriksha iha tishtati. He stands here in the tree. So because of this continuous ambiguity in language, the people who worked in the sciences, the people who worked in philosophy and logic got really, really annoyed with this. And they invented a whole other kind of Sanskrit, which they call Shastrik Sanskrit, in which instead of saying Vriksha Iha Tishtati, you would say something like this. There is an agent, there is an activity which leads to a connection activity which has an agent none other than tree, etc., etc., trying to reduce ambiguity. Right? And I'm not kidding, they wrote, actually, they wrote whole books like this. Because if you're trying to do philosophy, understanding what the other person is saying is extremely important. You can't have ambiguity. But the poets, poets love ambiguity. Right? Poets and artists love suggestion. So the frivolous poets decided to have some fun with this. Right. So this is from a play from the sixth century. The situation here is that there is a sophisticated man about town, kind of a, like a rich friend from the Kama Sutra, and he's got a girlfriend. And he's done something really awful, like men tend to do. And the girlfriend is really, really upset with him. So what he does is, he sends another girl, a woman, as a go-between to the girlfriend to try and persuade her that she should take him back. And so this woman goes and tells the girlfriend, as a good go-between might, not prone to anger, you're surely at your best when kind to others. Good thing to say, right, to an angry girlfriend. But as it turns out, the go-between woman doesn't really like this girlfriend. And if you take this sentence and pass it slightly differently, it can actually also mean 
Surely it is because you are angry and unkind that you ended up lonely and miserable. <laughs> and then if you take it apart slightly differently, it can also mean, oh angry one being godless, you are surely lonely and miserable. Or it can mean, when you are soulless and cannot help being angry, you are surely unattractive. So you can see why this would delight poets and dramatists and artists, right? Here you just don't have subtext, you have multiple text, right? The same sentence you can have saying four things at the same time. And so what they call this was shlesha. And shlesha literally means embrace, but in the poetic context it means the poetry of simultaneous meaning. Right? So you have one text that contains within itself simultaneously four meanings. They would have called this four target poetry. That is to say, a shloka which has four meanings. We have examples of seven target poetry. Right? One shloka that has seven meanings at the same time. Now people did other kind of very interesting and sophisticated things with this. Here's one from the 17th century. It's a devotional poem to Rama, right? So he, uh, Vishnu comes down to earth as Rama, his mind is fixed on that beautiful woman, etc., etc. Lovely verse, excellent devotional emotion contained within it. But there's something interesting if you go down to the last line and you start reading backwards. So, Yodhye Vase, if you read it backwards, becomes Seva Dhyeyo. And if you read the entire shloka backwards, it, it contains an entirely different meaning. And it's a shloka then which is devoted to Krishna, who is, you know, as usual, charming, beautiful women and is being delighted by milkmaids, etc., etc. So it has one meaning if you read it forward, another if you read it backwards. It's a poem of 30 shlokas. If you read, as you go forward through it, if you read Anuloma with the grain, it's a devotional poem about Rama. If you read Viloma against the grain, it's a devotional poem about Krishna. Are your minds blown? I hope they are. <laughs> okay. So this is pretty incredible, right? But the grand prize of Shlesha poetry the tradition agrees that one of the greatest poems in the Shlesha mode that was ever written was by this man called Kaviraja, king of the poets. We don't actually know what his real name was. This was his poetic, um, what is it called? Nom de plume. Right? So what he's doing is he's depicting a scene from the Ramayana when um, Hanuman goes looking for Sita and he's captured by Ravana's minions. And Ravana makes that stupid supervillain move of saying, light, you know, light his tail on fire. And Ravana goes jumping all over Lanka. I mean, Hanuman goes jumping all over Lanka and he burns it down. But what is really interesting about this is that if you pass it slightly differently, it becomes a scene from the Mahabharata. And what is happening here, this is the beginning of the battle as Arjuna's chariot rushes towards the ranks of the Kauravas. And remember the flag that Arjuna is flying, his Dhwaja? On it is an image of Hanuman. And as the story goes in the Mahabharat, when this is happening, the Hanuman, the figure of Hanuman on the flag starts to roar. Right? So what is amazing about this is that Kaviraja constructs an, a long epic poem which simultaneously tells the stories of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata together. And it's not just that he's doing this, simultaneous storytelling, it's that just like in this example that I showed you, the simultaneous scenes comment on each other. Right? So, in the Mahabharata, what, that see, what the roaring Hanuman on the flag recalls is that episode from the Ramayana when he was burning down Lanka and roaring, right? So as you read Kaviraja's poems, you're reading two poems simultaneously, and each poem is commenting and reflecting backwards and forwards on each other. Right? So there's a third meta-meaning being constructed, 
in the middle of this poem through this one text. Right? And so as Yegal Bronner points out, um, what it does, what he manages to do is to show you how the two epics are inseparable and how they are beautifully intertwined, how they reflect each other. Okay. So Chitrakavya and Shlesha are, are hugely popular. We can start seeing evidence of these two forms starting sometime at the beginning of the first millennium CE. And it's done all the way into the early 20th century. So how is it that so few people know about this? Um, and as it's become a kind of cliche to say this in post-colonial India, but the truth is that the bloody Brits arrived. Right? And so the transmission of this traditional literature got broken. And not only broken, it got very consciously, in a sense, destroyed. So this is from the mid-19th century. It's a professor in our very own Elphinstone College, down on Marine Drive, who is prescribing the syllabus for Sanskrit for undergraduate and graduate students. And what he's saying is that this, this kind of writing, this kind of Shlesha and Chitrakavya writing is monstrous. And it must be removed from the syllabus of what people who wanted to learn Sanskrit were to be taught. And they took it out. I should also tell you that this, the book that he's talking about here, the Kadambari, is a novel from the seventh century. And it's one of the greatest and most influential pieces of literature written in the subcontinent ever. There's a commentator from the twelfth century, a critic, who wrote about it. It is right that poets should fall silent upon hearing the Kadambari, for the sacred law rules that recitation must cease when the sound of an arrow is heard. And there's a lovely little Shlesha play even in this compliment, right? Because if you look at the beginning of the second line, Barna Dhanav, that's the sound of an arrow. But the man who wrote the Kadambari was Barna. So you can also read it as when the poetry of Barna is heard. Right? Down to this very day, in some Indian languages, the word for novel is Kadambari, because of the influence of this one book. Not many people will remember, th know that, actually. They might call them Kadambaris, but they won't know where this comes from. So within the Indian knowledge tradition, within the Indian literary tradition, Shlesha and Chitrakavya was sometimes looked upon by the heavy-duty intellectual critics like Anand Vardhana as being kind of tacky, as being frivolous. But when the colonial presence starts to make it known, a different kind of rhetoric and linguistic, uh, a, a different kind of diction is attached to this. This is a very, very influential German scholar, Albrecht Weber. Some of you will know, have heard his name and remember him. And so look at what he says, Schleschla works are a real Indian jungle and their authors are no better at the very best than specious savages, right? So here you can hear all the sort of echoes of Orientalism, right? Where everything that is pre-modern in India is seen as savage, as jungly, right? As crude. So I think this is the reason why we know so little about this literature down to our current time. In the 19th and 20th centuries, most, unfortunately, most Indian historians and literary scholars also imbibed and internalized this view of Shlesha and Chitrakavya. So if you read people like D.D. Kosambi, famous historians, when they, if they notice this literature, they will also use phrases like um, useless, decadent lunacy, right? Um, decadent play with language that has no intellectual or moral content, etc., etc. And so now I think we've come to a situation where Shlesha continued almost into the 20th century. It did actually. One of the great, great masters of Shlesha was a, a guy who worked in Tamil named Vempatur Pichuvayar, 
who died in 1910, and he was known as the Tiger of Schleicher. There was an absolute brilliant master of niyamam, of writing poems within a constricted uh, rule set, named Sri Charla Bhashyakara Shastri Garu, who died in 1949. But I didn't know these names until I started trying to look into this, this kind of poetry, and they died without anyone noticing their passing. So I think we've come to a situation in which you could take a thousand very educated Indians and ask them, what is Chitrakavya, what is Shlesha? And maybe one or two would be able to give you an answer, if that. But that's a really depressing, depressing note. I don't want to leave you on that. I want to show you just one last example of some extraordinary work. Okay. This is a poem from the 9th century called the Devi Shataka. It usually is translated as the goddess's century. Or you can also understand that title as a hundred shlokas in praise of the goddess. Right? So the poet here is writing devotional shlokas to his Devi. And what is extraordinary about this is that as you go through the hundred shlokas, you find example after example of all the forms that we've seen and dozens of others besides done in a way that is absolutely spectacular. Absolutely amazing. Right? I'm going to show you just one. Okay, so this is a shloka, I think this is 82. That, that one that I just showed you, right? You, can, you constantly give mantras studied by those, etc., etc. If we do our usual syllabic operation on this, you realize straight away that it's a Gomutrika Bandha. Right? So if you read diagon uh, zigzag, sada vya ja va si, right? you get the first line. And then if you read in the opposite direction from the bottom left upwards, dada vya ja, you get the second line. Okay? So go mutrika bandha. Pretty, pretty difficult to do. But what is extraordinary about this is that it's actually a double go mutrika bandha. So if you take the first half, the first pada of the first line, right, what's in the, inside the red brackets, and then you take the second half, which is between the green brackets, and you put them below each other, you get a Gomutrika Bandha there too. Right? Do you see that? Sada Vya Java. You can reconstitute the entire first line by going zigzag, zigzag in both directions. Now, if there are any computer scientists or mathematicians here, what you realize is that you've got symmetries within symmetries. And once you start doing that, you have the possibilities of a combinatorial explosion. And as Daniel Ingalls puts it, because you have the possibility of doing the zigzag in so many ways, for each syllable in the first half of the first line, there are four possibilities of how you can constitute the entire first line. Don't worry if this is not making sense. It's actually just, it requires a little thinking. But what happens because of this is that the entire poem, there are 4,260,312,864 ways of reading the poem inside itself. Okay? So it's not just a Go Mutrika Bandha, it is a double Go Mutrika Bandha, and it is also a Jala Bandha. Jala meaning net. Right? It forms a net. You can see the figure of the net. All right. So this is what I mean when it's spectacular, right? Like, so if, if uh, Vedanta Deshika is the lion of poetry, this guy is like lion raised to the power of ten. Right? But that's not all. The last 20 shlokas, 80 through 100, in the century of shlokas written for the goddess, if you take the first line of each of 80 through 96, 16 shlokas, and you write them, you position them like spokes on a wheel, and then you take the rest of the lines that are left and you start writing around the rim, you soon realize that it's been designed so that all these parts fit together like a Lego set or like a Meccano set. And what they make is this figure. 
this is a maha chakra and in this case because it's a poem to the devi it's a devi maha chakra the great wheel of the goddess but that's not all okay i'm going to magnify the very top of that image and if you go down three syllables from the top in that most vertical column from twa to ga to de and then from de you start reading to the right like this every third you know you just keep going round the circle every third syllable when you describe the entire circle what you find is a hidden shloka and in the hidden shloka the poet has explained why he wrote the poem and how he wrote the poem right so the son of norna he tells us has written this difficult stotra in loving worship of the devi and the devi came to him in a dream and told him to do this this is why he's done it and she also instructed him how to do it now the kicker in all of this is that this son of norna turns out to be none other than our friend anand vardhana you remember the literary snob who said that chitra kavya is only fit for beginners that guy and we know because of internal evidence in the poem that this is not an early career work that he did at the age of 18 it's a late career work he does this after he writes that so what is the great anand vardhana doing this right it would be like some heavy duty critic i was trying to think of a contemporary analogy this morning and the only one that i could come up with is that some heavy duty film critic who talks about bresson and always refers to foucault and derrida and hates has made a career out of hating commercial indian cinema suddenly it was revealed to have made the greatest bollywood film of all time so scholars have spent a kind of great deal of energy in trying to figure this out and ingels who's one of the great scholars argues that it's a kind of freudian drama right that anand vardhana always has this huge talent but he just can't bear to write this stuff because it's so tacky and so frivolous and it's the kind of thing that socialites do he doesn't want to do it until suppressed desire emerges in a dream in the form of the devi and like you know if the devi comes in to you in a dream and tells you to do something if you have any sense you do it and he goes off and does this spectacular thing but i've spent a lot of the last 5 years looking at this figure at the maha chakra it's the screen saver on this laptop that i'm using right now and what i'm always reminded of when i look at this is that there is evidence that anand vardhana was a kashmiri and that he was a shakta which is to say he was a follower in one of the strands of what we now refer to as kashmir shaivism except that as being a shakta instead of uh, worshiping shiva as the ultimate reality he worshiped shakti and in the tantric tradition language is hugely important so those of you who studied a little bit of tantra might know this that when you, when an initiate who knows what he or she is doing says a mantra it's not that she is using the mantra to speak to the goddess it's not that she is using the mantra to summon the goddess to her the sounds of the mantra the phonemes of the mantra are the goddess herself the sounds of the mantra are the body of the goddess so in this tradition language is a goddess and the goddess is language and language is what has created the universe all of us live within language so it's always seemed to me looking at this image that what we see before us is of course an act of devotion by a man who perhaps has had his earlier career career arrogance knocked off him and he's finally realized that it's too easy to make judgments about what is really poetry and what is not poetry and who has also realized that when you play with language in any form you are playing with devi you are playing with goddess and so what we see before us is an act of devotion i think it's an act of just astonishing literary genius and also it's a yantra of the goddess and because it's an image made with language itself what we are looking at is devi herself we are looking at the goddess when we see this and therefore we should react to it 
of course, with amazement. Thank you. So uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but if any of you, hmm? OK, we have 10 minutes for questions, if you have any. I'll try to answer them. I should warn you that I'm not an expert. This is all very amateur research, and my Sanskrit is of the first or second grade variety. But I'll try and answer if you have questions. And uh, I think there are people going around with mics. So if anybody wants to answer, ask a question, raise your hand, and somebody will bring this to you. Devi, what, what has it done to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I have to say that uh, I, the reason I spent five years looking at this is because I am obsessed with language in any case, right? And um, my sister Anu was yesterday talking to an interviewer in front of me, and he asked her, what do you remember about your brother when you were kids? And he said, my, my only memory of him is reading all the time. Right? So I was the biggest bookworm on earth. I had these thick glasses. I'm wearing contact lenses now. So I think that attraction to language has, is what drew me to this in the first place. And then I think the second thing is that, that uh, it becomes a kind of meditation when you try and understand this. Right? There have been two times in my research on this when I've understood what somebody is doing in their poems and my mind has been so shattered that I actually, I'm not making this up, I literally had to go and lie down for half an hour to recover. And this was one of them, when I finally understood what he had done. So I think what happens is that you start to understand that, that and I, I suppose you could say that it's a revelation about the Indian tradition, but it's also a revelation that human beings can actually make such things, right? It's, it's amazing. I'm proud to be part of a race which, despite all its faults and its murderousness, can actually make something as perfect as this. And um, last year, um, I, was at a, I teach at a writer's conference in the US. And um, I gave the same talk, and I showed them these slides. And there was a young 25-year-old, I think he looked like, American writer. And he walked up to me, and he was crying. And he said, look, I'm an atheist. But if I ever have any reason to believe in God, this is why I'll believe, right? That the human brain is capable of doing this. Um, so in me, it, what it does to me is that it creates this emotion of awe, of amazement, right? And so I think that early Anand Vardhana idea that this is not real poetry, I I've accepted it when I first read it, but <laughs> increasingly, like I think him, have come to question that. Right? And like I was saying, when you play with language, any kind of play with language is, is delightful. Right? It introduces in us pleasure. And um, I'm very in alignment with these tantric series of aesthetic philosophers. And what they argued was that rasa, the experience of aesthetic pleasure, is exactly the same thing as the pleasure of becoming one with Shiva or Shakti. It is not analogous to, it is not different from. It is enlightenment itself that you get when you experience aesthetic pleasure. And you know, for various reasons, I don't have the discipline to be a good yogi <laughs> or to be a good meditator. I care too much about good food and you know, other pleasureful things. But I like to believe that in this amazement, right, that I experience something of that highest enlightenment. Right? Because they also point out, and Anand, uh, Abhinava Gupta, who was a great, uh, the next philosopher who follows on Anand Vardhana's ideas and develops them, he points out that yogis, when they reach that stage of enlightenment, what they utter is chamatkara, chamatkara. Because what they realize is the astonishment of this universe, how marvelously beautiful and full it is. But that's exactly what the aesthetic receiver, the reader, the viewer, experiences in the experience of art. We also go chamatkar, chamatkar, right? So I don't know if that made any sense, but <laughs> that's something like it. This one. Hello, sir. Uh, so uh, I'm a, actually a mathematics student. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm a mathematics student, actually. So I was wondering that you I mean, made references to 
uh, say things in group theory and other stuff. So could you uh, probably suggest us some references to read? On I, I can't. Sorry. I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, can you provide us some references that we could read on this topic as a mathematician? Oh, as a mathematician, that's a really interesting question. You know, I have to say that there is a lot of stuff that has been written about the Indian academic writing, scholarly writing about the Indian tradition of mathematics, but I haven't seen much that actually connects aesthetics with, with uh, linguistics or aesthetics with art, except <coughs> by these guys themselves, right? So, um, Dhanyaloka, Anand Vardhana's work is a great meditation, but it's a linguistic <laughs> investigation uh, more than anything else. And I should also say that Chitrakavya and Shlesha are hugely understudied, right? Shlesha was a very popular form for 2000 years. And yet that book by Yigal Bronner that I showed on the slide called Extreme Poetry is the only book length study of this form, right? And again, I would argue that this is because of this colonial hangover. And even in global academia today, studying Chitrakavya and Shlesha looked upon as slightly sort of low class. <laughs> you don't want to do it if you're trying to get promotions. Although there is starting to be a change. I know of three or four scholars in Europe and in the States who are working on it. Um, there is one astonishing work of scholarship that has been made by an Indian guy named V. Bala Subramaniam. And Bala Subramaniam is now, I believe, 87 or 88 years old. After he retired, he heard about this poetry, got fascinated with it, taught himself Sanskrit in order to be able to read it, taught himself how to use Photoshop because he had to illustrate all of this, and has produced a three-volume work called Chitram, which you should take a look at. Right? But it's completely from outside the academy. You know, Bala Subramaniam, uh, Mr. Bala Subramaniam has no academic credentials. He's just done it out of love. Uh, he lives in Madras. I was hoping to go to Chennai and meet him, but I shall have to wait for my next visit. Uh, so, so, about the group theory thing that you mentioned, so somebody would have analyzed it, right? Somebody from the academia. Sorry, uh, again, louder, please. Ah. <laughs> so, so, the group theory thing that you were mentioning about D4, in the, there was one of the po poems that you mentioned in the presentation. So somebody would have analyzed it in, from the academia, right? Analyze what, sorry? The uh, analyze the poem in academia to know that there's the group theory connection. The, uh, you mean the Devi Shataka, the, yeah, the Ma yeah, Chakra? Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah. Daniel Ingalls has a great paper on it, which is called Anand Vardhanash Devi Shataka. Okay. And if you do Google search for it, you'll be able to find it. Okay, I'm being told there's what, are we out of time? One, one more question, yeah, over there. Hi, I really enjoyed this. A uh, couple of questions and a request. So my first question is, you've written a lot of novels, would you consider writing poetry? Uh, or writing a book around Chitra Kavya as part of the plot or centered around it? Uh, would you also be willing to share this presentation on like, like maybe a public platform? Because I think a lot of people need to see this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on an essay about this. And, and the plan is actually, I hope to uh, finish it sometime in the next year. Um, partly also because we've been waiting on, on a couple of poems um, to get them translated and worked on. Uh, the man that I mentioned, uh, uh, Bhashyakara um, Shastri, has written the other poems I was talking about where I had to go and lie down. That guy has written a poem which made me go lie down because I couldn't deal with how amazing it was. But the trouble is that he has written a commentary on it which is in Telugu Lipi in Sanskrit. So we are in the process of getting that actually transliterated into Devanagari. Then we will get it translated. Then we will finally be able to write about it. So the plan is to, in the next year or two, I hope to have something ready and it will be on the web. And my fantasy is that I'll find some excellent artists to make the to actually animate these poems, right? So you see the letters being pulled apart and you see the arrows going between the two. So let's see, I'll, I'll tr I, I really want to do it. Yeah, and one last question. What do you think of this whole tradition of you know, our universities celebrating literature, especially a lot of young people you know, being offered literature as courses and it's fairly common. 
people do not really study languages like all like the top universities give prominence to literature scholars who dissect what uh, the I blue see. curtains right. mean but right. the whole conversation on structure and beauty and complexity in languages lost right i think that's a global problem right that you're always looking at literature say through a marxist lens right and trying to understand what are the power structures that are reflected in this or you're trying to take about the gender politics but i think in a global sense people have uh, shied away from talking about aesthetics and beauty you know it's thought of to be a little bit naive uh, to to say oh this is really beautiful but i think it's coming back more and more uh, and it's coming back in interesting ways in the sense that uh there are people who are in psychology who are interested in the cognitive process of engagement with art right so they're asking the question why do you when you look at certain pieces of art why are you most affected by that piece of art which then requires you to define what beauty is and how beauty works on human consciousness so i think there's a lot of interesting work in that area that's going on one more oh, oh are we done okay thanks a lot for coming thank you